lay our burdens down this morning. And sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the father's house Arrival's not the end game. Arrival's not the end game. The journey's where we are. You never want it perfect, you just want it by heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the father is. Yeah, let's hear it. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room Ooh, and lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Put your hands together. Let's hear it. The prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors, prison doors fling wide. The dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father. Miracles! Miracles take place Cynical fun faith Love is breaking through And the Father's in Jericho Jericho walls are quaking Strongholds now are shaking Love is breaking through And the Father's in Love is breaking through Love is breaking through the Father's in the room Ooh, Lay your burdens down Ooh, Here in the Father's house Check your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, You're in the So we just we just sang about laying our burdens down in the song there's some specifics right like leaving your shame at the door maybe your past at the door things maybe that hap happened before now but I think it's also important I know it's also important to lay other burdens down maybe burdens you walked in the door with maybe stress anxiety fear um, just anything that can create a burden and I know there's a lot of people walking around with burdens right now. 
all sorts of different things, including myself. And I've been reminded lately how important it is to verbally, with our voices or in our hearts towards God, lay our burdens down. The, The classic verse, lay your burdens at his feet. It's very easy to say that. It's very hard to do, right? Very hard to do. And so I want to take a moment in between songs. We're going to do another song in just a second. I just want us to close our eyes. And if you have a burden, just lift it to God right now. And we're going to pray. And whatever that is, there's all sorts of different burdens. We're going to give that to God right now before we get to the next song, okay? So let's just take a moment and pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of miracles, that you are the God that takes our burdens. You take our anxieties. You take our fears. You take our health and you make it into what you want it to be, Lord. And so we come to you in the name of Jesus right now and we lay our specific burden at your feet and we ask you, Lord, to take it. Jesus died on the cross once and for all, once and for all for everything, for our sins, for our burdens, for our anxieties, for our health, for our futures. And so we claim that promise, Lord. We claim your word, and we claim the blood of Jesus over our hearts, over our minds, over our bodies, over our families, over our futures, over our careers, over our finances, over our children. And we pray in Jesus' name to touch us, Lord, in the different ways that you know we need. You know us better than we do, Lord. You know what causes these burdens better than we do. And so we give that to you, Lord. We give it to you right now. And we claim the power of God, the power of Jesus to heal these things and to move in these areas right now. The enemy has no authority in this place or in our lives. So we claim the power of God in the name of Jesus to take these burdens and fill us with more of your peace, more of your mercy, more of your grace, God. And we thank you for what you're what you've done and what you're going to continue to do today. So we give that to you, Lord, and we turn our focus to you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Church holy Holy Spirit you 
God we sing praise God we sing God we sing sing praise. God, we Thank you, Lord. We worship you today. Lord, we sing praise and we worship you. There's none like you. We thank you for the things you're doing in our lives, the things you're going to continue to do. We pray that you'll be with us today. You'll be with the words that are spoken for your glory, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm Zane, and welcome to The Gathering. The Genesis Walk Museum is here today. This mobile multi-sensory experience brings the Bible to life all within a trailer. The museum is full of displays that show the Bible is true and answers questions like, did God really create the world in six literal days? And how can we trust the Bible? And much more. We hope you take the time after the gathering to enjoy this fun experience. Also, if you're new around here, we'd love to get to know you a little better. Please fill out one of these blue connect cards at Guest Central, turn it in, and receive your welcome bag. While you're there, you can ask any questions you might have about our church. And every Wednesday evening is family night here at Life Church. That means we have classes for all ages, from adults all the way down to the itsy bitsy babies. Come join us at 6.30 p.m. And hey, have you been thinking about being baptized? or maybe you're looking for more information about why baptism is a part of the Christian faith walk, on November 6th, we will be hosting a short informational class and we'd love for you to attend. Please sign up at Guest Central or online. Also, Operation Christmas Child kicks off today. This ministry collects shoebox gifts for children in need around the world. Each box is prayerfully and uniquely packed full of toys and other items to delight the heart of a child. When those lids come off those boxes, you've never seen such pure joy. This is amazing. As you can see, the children's faces, they're excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. Make sure to pick up your boxes at Guest Central on your way out and return them by November 13th. And finally, if you're a parent or guardian of little ones who get a little noisy during the service, please check out the mother's room right outside the auditorium or the family room at the end of the kids' wing, room 104. You can continue watching the service live on the TV. Please feel free to use these rooms at any time during the service. That's all I've got for you today. Have a happy Sunday, and now back to the gathering.
We're not playing church. We don't want to. What we just heard is a prayer, really, of dedication. We don't want to come in and sing and listen and go out the same. We want. We want more of the Lord. This is a song that I've been singing um, on YouTube, you know, you hear me talk about that, over the last month, two months. And it's a song of surrender, Lord, here I am waiting, abide in me. Friends, in our time in history, we see our world struggling right now man we need we need the Lord we need him so I'm going to encourage you to stand with me and pray this song back to the Lord and maybe you've been struggling man and maybe you feel beat up today But God is here. We have invited him, and he wants to make a difference in each one of our lives. Will you let him do that? If you've built a wall against him, if you've uh, hardened your heart towards him, maybe as you pray this prayer, the Lord wants to invade your space. Why? Because he loves you. Let him do that. And so let's stand together and sing.
Lord, we realize this uh, is kind of a surrender song. We want you to take over. It's easy to do the American Christian thing, and that's where we come to church and we do our duty, and yet we live our lives the way we want to the rest of the week. And we get pushed around spiritually. We give in to temptation. We allow life-controlling addictions to pull us with a chain. We allow our anger to explode with those that we say we love. Come. Come live in us, Lord, we pray. We're waiting. We give you permission to invade every corner of our lives, Lord, right now. We confess our sin to you right now, Lord. Our rebellion, our lack of faith, our compromise. Lord, you are all in for us and we wanna be all in for you. That's our prayer. We thank you, Spirit of God, for uh, moving in our lives right now, Lord. <laughs> thank you for restoring us. Thank you for encouraging us in our walk. Oh, how we need you. Oh, how we need you, Lord. Oh, how we need you, Lord. Let's sing that chorus again, friends. Let's sing it with gratitude, with love back to our Heavenly Father who loves us so much. Let's express our gratitude as we cry out to Him. Amen. Here we go.
Lord, let's lift our voices to him and thank him for his goodness, for his forgiveness. We praise you, Lord. We bless your name, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Mighty God, you are mighty God. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being here today, those of you watching online. May the Spirit of God continue His good work in all of us. You watching online as well. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are excited about what God's doing in your life. We celebrate his great work. I can tell you that he's doing, he's working in me because I need him. I need more of him. And um, it's cool that the God who's created everything knows everything about us, and he wants to spend time with us. In fact, he wants to spend eternity with you. And um, so, that's good news. Hey, we've got a, a guest, Dave Barker from Life and Messiah, visiting uh, from uh, Florida. It's a terrible place to live, we know. Uh, that's why he's in Wisconsin right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, following the gathering, if you want to uh, talk to him, he'll be willing to hang out with you. Um, and just a shout out, two weeks ago we had the chili lunch here, man, and I just want to thank all the volunteers, all, man, the cleanup, everything, man. What a day. It was a great day. So let's give it up for all the work that went into that. Yeah. Mm. Not me. Cameo. Cameo, who sang over here. So, uh, yeah. Hey, you should have your uh, outline, and those of you who are watching online, you could pull it up on the Life Church Facebook page, uh, um, um, the Life Church web page. Yeah. So um, it's fun to track. And listen, we are uh, we're continuing in the Book of Philippians, and um, I'm excited about it. I'm excited what, uh, that God had Paul, who was chained to a praetorium guard. That's the premier military team that uh, protected Caesar. Um, they were kind of like uh, the Navy SEALs of the day. And uh, he was chained with a, a chain to a, a guard 24 th- uh, hours a day, seven days a week, 18 inches long. And yet Paul was fired up because God was using him even there. And friends, if God can use Paul under house arrest, he can use you. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Now, I know there's a lot of things competing for your time and your attention today. And you have to be, and I have to be very intentional about um, hanging out with him, allowing him to 
uh, speak into our lives. So, um, this is a little background to uh, the intro. Uh, Armageddon seemed to arrive in Manhattan on Monday, September 29th, 2008. For those of you that were around back then, you know uh, what was going on in our country and around the world. It wasn't just happening in New York, but in Moscow, Hong Kong, London, and Frankfurt. And then on Tuesday, the day after the plagues and locusts were loosed on the world, the U.S. stock market fell hard again. Japan was sinking into the sea. Brazil's market was down 51% year-to-date. Central banks were cutting rates. Even so, unemployment was still on the rise. Consumer spending was falling. House prices were going down. That was um, secular economists writing, and they're using biblical terminology there. Uh, David Jeremiah writes this. You may find it strange that in the what I just read, secular financial writers William Bonner and Addison Wigan describe economic woes with biblical imagery. It seems that when crises loom large enough, the world, the word Armageddon starts getting its time in the spotlight. Crises are catalysts to an organized progression of changes. And there is little doubt that the world has been driven toward greater globalization by crises. Today's proponents of the one world economy embrace the philosophy of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, a German philosopher of the 1800s. Hegel theorized that by planning and actually producing crises, leaders can gain enormous power by stepping in and promising solutions. Desperate people will give power to those who seem to have the answers to the crises. As a result, little by little, fewer and fewer make more and more of the decisions. Pastor Kyle Eidelman, Eidelman, pastors in Louisville, Kentucky, tells when 2009, so what we just hit was 2008, 2009, he's talking to his dad, um, who was 61 years old at the time, and Kyle says that's near the age of retirement, Um, and my dad made a modest living for most of his life, but he had a He had been a disciplined saver. And so father and son, they were having a conversation about his retirement account, and I asked them what kind of hit he had taken because of what's happened around the world earlier. And he said his account was down 40% from where it had been a year before. Kyle says, yeah, he wasn't alone. A lot of people were experiencing that. And so... I asked him, as his son, how are you and mom feeling about losing so much money? And he smiled at me. And he said, well, it was never mine to begin with. And then he quoted Philippians 4.19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Hmm. You see, God has given you and I his resources for a short time here on earth. So really, we have much to be grateful for, don't we? And um, it's good. It would be good to start your day recognizing that everything you have really belongs to God. Right? Right? You get out of God's bed, and you walk into God's bathroom, and you turn on God's shower, and then you put on God's clothes, eat God's cereal, and drink God's coffee. Some of you are doing that right now. Get into God's car, and you head to work, right? 
You see, when we start to see everything we have as God's, it helps us develop an attitude of being thankful. There's a lot of moaning and groaning going on now because of these retirement accounts, friends, right? There's a pessimistic mood in the air. (laughs) Paul could have gone down that road, man. Two years tied up with a Roman soldier. He's not going anywhere. Huh? Could have become very bitter towards God, but instead he was thankful and joyful where he was and what God was doing in and through him. And friends, we have to be careful. We have to guard our hearts and we have to guard our minds that we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Because he owns it all. Anyway. Right? Yep. And so, in your outline, you'll see Corey Ten Boom. Man, are we using her a lot lately? Have you noticed? And Betsy, her sister, man, in a Ravensbrook concentration camp. Betsy was fired up being there. She was good with the fleas because it gave her an opportunity to let her light shine with the other women in her barrack. How can that be? How can that be? I've held many things in my hands and I have lost them all, but whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. And so in Deuteronomy 14, 23, the Living Bible, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your life. And we've, we hit this a few weeks ago. Tithing is a constant reminder that it's God's, not mine. You know? It's just a reminder. Keeps us, gives us perspective and balance. And so uh, let's go to Philippians. And um, I'm going to pick it up at verse 13, Philippians 4.13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, Paul writes. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help. When I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia, no other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. And I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At that moment, at the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus, they are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God, what Kyle's father quoted, who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you again, Lord, for your word. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for changing us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. On the screen, you'll see a a photograph of Paul under house arrest. (laughs) How has it survived? (laughs) 2,000 years in the archives. Huh? You ever wonder about that? Well, there he is. And um, um, he's thinking, you know, he's thinking. That's kind of an inside look. And here's what Paul's thinking. He's thinking... Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all I need. That's really what he just said there, right? What we just read about. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. And that is a good reminder. In your notes, live to trust God's power, number one. Your answers have already been given there. And Paul is... um, talking about that he can do everything God wants him to do. Even though he's under house arrest, he can do everything God wants him to do because of Christ giving him strength. It's not his strength, it's the strength from Almighty God. And that word strength, by the way, is where we get our English word dynamite. Did you see the results of dynamite out here when you came in this morning? Holy smoke! Man, when they're blowing stuff up out there... I mean, it lifts the ground, you know? And I don't know if you've seen some of the 
huge rock. I mean, boulders. What's bigger than a boulder? Bigger boulders. <laughs> right? Bigger boulders, man. And dynamite has the power. That, that rock could not be penetrated unless it was blown up. And God has penetrated you and me with his love. The rocky soil and the rocky stony hearts, man, that we had, he blew that up and exchanged it for a soft, pliable ground where he can plant good seed. Aren't you glad for that today? With him working in us. And so Paul is, he's fired up because God's dynamite, his power is working in Paul. And Paul is sensing that. He realizes he couldn't do what he's doing without the great work of God. In Philippians 2.13, for God is working in you, Paul writes, giving you the desire and the power. That word power is an active power. It's not a it's not a used to power. It's not, you know, this power is going to, no, it's an act of power. It's in you to do what pleases him. And I, this verse has been just, man, ringing the bell in my mind. It's God. God is working in you. He's giving you the desire and the power, an act of power to do what pleases him. And I hope he's doing that in your life. I hope you give him permission to do that as well. And so... Paul is saying that uh, this verse 13 doesn't give you permission to do whatever you want. That's not what Paul's writing about. But God is promising Paul and you and I that he will give us the power, the strength to do everything God wants us to do. God's will in your life and my life, it will happen. And for which we're grateful. Paul is... Also talking about um, living to trust God's power. He, uh, Rome was a world power back then. They intimidated their enemies. They were brutal on the battlefield. And Paul was experiencing some of that even under house arrest. And here we are in 2022. And our world is struggling. Which leads us to number two. We need to live to give in the chaos. We're living in chaos right now. In John 14, 1, Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. And shortly thereafter, in John 16, 33, he said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I don't know about you, but I find that very encouraging. First of all, that Jesus recognized, he knows the future. He knows each one of us. He knows we face trouble. Um, And he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You're going to face trouble, but don't let your hearts be troubled. I've been going through uh, uh, James and 1 Peter recently, and this is stuff that kind of jumped out at me. Because I get it, many, even in this room and those watching online, you feel the weight, uh, the pressure of our world. Things are changing rapidly. In James 1, 2 through 4, James, the half-brother to Jesus, the the half-brother who rejected Jesus as he was growing up, But after the resurrection, when he saw Jesus come out of that grave, man, it opened his eyes to realize that Jesus was who he said he was and is, the Savior of the world. And James put his faith in Christ. And he says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles, you get that? When troubles, you know what that means in the original? It means trials, calamities, afflictions. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for what? And you're thinking, is, did James have too much pepperoni the night before when he wrote that, man? You know? 
My, my, I'm going to give you a little insight into my house this morning. Debbie said, and I struggled sleeping last night because, because she had sushi later than she should have. See? <laughs> Did that happen? Did that happen to James here, man? Is he messed up? How can that be? He says, consider an opportunity for great joy when, when troubles come. It's an opportunity, see? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Yeah. And then first Peter, our good friend Peter, says, so be truly glad... That means to celebrate, to exalt, to rejoice exceedingly. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. How many of you know, no matter how long you live on planet Earth, eternity is so much longer, right? Do you realize that? That's why Peter can say for just a little while, because... When you compare this life, this temporary life, next to eternity, there's no comparison. And so these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Peter is saying Jesus is coming back again. And then 1 Peter 4, 12, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening. So, hey, if you're freaking out today, you shouldn't be. This should be... There's nothing strange about it because we were told these things would happen. Instead, be very glad. That means to be full of joy. Be very glad. He doesn't say be glad. He says very glad. (laughs) To be full of joy for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the what? Wonderful joy. That's, again, the same word, rejoice exceedingly of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. David Jeremiah, once again, and I'm going to refer to him um, often these next few minutes because I trust him, Um, his insight. He wrote, Our world is in bad shape, and sometimes we feel that way too. In our better moments, we know we're encompassed by God's blessing, yet we seem to struggle mightily with anxiety, fear, resentment, and discouragement. The chaos of the world seeps into our hearts. Fear can erode faith if we let it. It's true. Is that true for you? From long experience, I have learned that staying mentally healthy in a crumbling world is our daily assignment. And we can't do it without a buoyant spiritual foundation for our lives. We need God Don't we? We've already said that. We need God. We need Christ and his teaching. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the scriptures and its prophecies about the future. And so, um, this Lee Grady, he's a a writer. And uh, he's been a follower of Christ for a while. And he wrote an article last week entitled, Why I Slept Good During the Pandemic. The last two and a half years have been incredibly stressful for everybody. People lost sleep because of the pandemic and because of so many other worries, inflation, the border crises, the war in Ukraine, and threats from China. Yet I slept well during the pandemic, and I'm not losing sleep now. The reason is that when the pandemic began, the Lord took me to Psalm 2, and I've been parked in that passage of Scripture ever since. How long has he been parked there? Two and a half years, right? See how good it is to camp out in the Bible. 
Mm, Psalm 2. So the psalmist describe, begins describing the agenda of wicked people. He says in verse 3, The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. The author of the psalm doesn't deny that evil men are scheming against the righteous. Psalm 2 says leaders who hate God will bring, seek to bring harm. It also reveals that their efforts are really aimed at the Lord. And Jesus, the Son of God, is the anointed or the Messiah. But notice that God isn't worried about his conspirators. There is no anxiety in heaven about viruses, nuclear wars, or genocide plots. Psalm 2.4 simply states, He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord scoffs at them. There's three things we can learn from this verse. One, the Lord is seated. He's not freaking out. He's not pacing back and forth in heaven. Two, the Lord is laughing. My fears and worries are calmed, and I realize how God views his enemies. And he actually finds it humorous that humans think they have enough money, fame, technology to challenge the creator of the universe. Three, he will scoff at them. It's interesting that before judging his enemies, God actually taunts the devil and those who are in, his, in the league with him. The Lord gives the wicked some warning of the wrath that is coming as a consequence of their rebellion. It brings me great comfort to know that all my, my all-powerful God will one day put his enemies in their place. I've read the last chapters of Revelation. I know the devil will be thrown into hell and those who serve Satan will end up in the lake of fire. And yet, in this age of divine grace, God has chosen to give even the wickedest of men a chance to find mercy. And at the close of Psalm 2, it says, Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son, or he will become angry, and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities, for his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. So Lee concludes, I can sleep at night because my refuge is in the Lord. I don't fret because of what I hear on the news. Instead, I stay close to his throne, listen to his laughter, and find shelter in his presence. I pray you will find that same peace in these troubling times. It's good, right? Exactly, that's where we're at. So, we're going to drill down quick for these next few moments. Stay with me. Mark Hitchcock, I just got his book called Global Reset. He wrote it this year. When the World Economic Forum gathered in January 2009... The 2,000 business and political leaders described the world economic disasters as a crisis of confidence. The official theme of the 2009 forum was shaping the post-crisis world. Klaus Schwab, the brainchild of the Great Reset, referred to the global economic meltdown as a transformational crisis. He urged the delegates to respond to the crises by shaping a new world order. Schwab said, above all else, there is, this is a crisis of confidence. To restore confidence, you have to establish signposts that the world after the crisis will be different. We have to create a new world. He also announced the launch of a global redesign initiative to rebuild the global economic system. Why am I talking about this? Because Paul was under house arrest, and he was not in panic mode. Nor was Kyle Eidelman's father when his retirement account crashed 40% in the past year. We need to be reminded, friends, of where the economy is going in our world because it's changing right before your eyes right now. And it's easy to get caught up in the now and miss the future. And we're racing towards the future. And so, the Great Reset and its cashless agenda are a catalyst and necessary to precede the one world economy of the Antichrist. 
Ancient prophecies in Scripture lay out the scenario in full color. History is headed toward a one-world government under the total control of Satan's superman, the Antichrist. To bring his control to fruition, this final ruler will have to control the global commerce, the finances, and impose a one-world economy. Without economic control, there is no real control. The control of the Antichrist over the world economy will undoubtedly precede his rise to global political power. Revelation 6 describes a global financial crisis during the time of the tribulation. Hyperinflation will be kicking in. When the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come, I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. In other words, you'll work a whole day to put food on your table for that day. The inflation will be so severe. And this financial crisis run away will be seized upon by the Antichrist. He will take advantage of that. And he'll become attractive to the world to put things back in order. The starting point, Revelation 13, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing the name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And so, um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the dude, Johan Osterlund. He lives in Sweden. That's him. He's injecting a chip in somebody's hand right now. Um, the man gasped as a tiny microchip about the size of a grain of rice and encased in silicate glass enters his body. Um, this is happening in Sweden, and Osterlund his, owns the company Biohacks International. He estimates that uh, more than 6,000 Swedes during his six years, his company's been in business, have taken the chip. And... Um, Osterland believes his company's success is connected to Sweden's culture of embracing new technology, technology that still frightens people in other parts of the world. The geopolitical situation historically gives us the kind of initial higher trust in the government, he said. I think a lot of people will be way more apprehensive in a lot of countries. But maybe you're thinking, doesn't the Bible say something about this? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So we just read it in Revelation um, 13. And you can go to Revelation 14, and that's where everybody who takes the mark, uh, you automatically will receive God's judgment on your life. Um, they have no, the, the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshiped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Um, recently he went through Daniel, and in Daniel 2 he gives a picture of global uh, governments. And when you look on your way down, um, we're in the modern age, and the Roman Empire, by the way, is being reignited through uh, the European Union. And it's believed that the Antichrist will come out of Europe. And so you look at Bible history, 2,500 years ago, Daniel predicted the future accurately. Babylon's gone, you know. The Medians and Persians are gone. The Greco-Macedonia, they're gone. The Roman Empire initially is gone, but they're coming back. Daniel predicted that. Friends, we have God's word to put our trust in that in the future... In the future, 
You cannot buy or sell unless you take the mark of the beast. And you don't want to do that. But that's where things are going. When you listen to um, the verbiage, the globalists, the globalists are looking for a one world government where they will usher in the Antichrist. We don't want globalists. We want our sovereignty as a nation. But you're seeing the push even in our country to become part of the one world government. So what the point is, friends, understand the times that we're living in. This is not a time to be messing around spiritually, you know, putting your toe in the spiritual water and see if you're going to... You need to get in and let God work in your life. And allow him to change you into the image of Jesus Christ. That will keep your balance no matter what happens on this planet. Okay? I know that was a little heavy, but I I think it's relevant for the days that we're living. We are changing, and there's a lot of things. A lot of stuff, you pull the curtain back, friends. The world is preparing for a one-world government right now. When you look at biblical history, you can trust the Bible. And when you go out through that trailer, you're going to see God's word can be trusted in creation and everything else. And so we go back. Here I am waiting. Abide in me. Let let the Lord abide in us as we abide in him. Father, we thank you this morning. It's kind of a a flare in the air of where we are historically on the timeline of human history. And Lord, we're racing towards the end, and we know that you're coming back, and we want to be ready for you, Lord. We want our lives to emulate you. We want our lives to model your character. And as the Apostle Paul postured himself under house arrest, he was excited that you were using him, even in those conditions. And Lord, here we are, right here, right now. We pray that you will use us to carry the light of Jesus Christ, to proclaim your truth. In Jesus' name. And if you're here this morning and you have not put your trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that because he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to reconcile you back to his father to have that relationship. And so, Jesus, I recognize that you died on the cross in my place. You took my place. You were my substitute. I should have gone to the cross to pay for my sin, but you went there And you paid my sin debt in full. So I thank you for taking my place. Thank you for forgiving my sin. And I put all my trust in you this morning, Lord. And I will live for you through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
Maybe this morning you need prayer. And, you know, maybe you want somebody to pray for you and with you. We'll have prayer teams up front. Maybe you just want to hang out right where you're at and just uh, as they continue to sing, you kind of camp out in God's presence and let him have his way. And if you need to go, uh, pray God's blessing on your life. So, Lord, thank you. You've been so faithful. You've been so good to us, Lord. You know every person in this room and those watching online, you know exactly what they're going through, what they're thinking. And you care about them. And you love them passionately. And we're grateful for a God who's like that. Not distant, not foreign, uh, not calloused, but involved. We pray your blessing, Lord, on each person. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.